Trustee Petlichka. I just think we need to send something to um, Betsy DeVos because on 60 Minutes last <laughs> night, she didn't know what Michigan schools were doing or where we were at. So um, maybe she needs to take a look at this. And oh, and we have a little video right now too that we're gonna show with Mr. Shigfrey. I forgot to mention that at the end. Just to celebrate and hopefully everyone here and then those who came for the celebration, you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting, but you're welcome too. <clears throat> thought that a fitting way to end the celebration. 
Thank you. Next item, Next acknowledgement item. of donations. Dr. Choco will come up. Good evening. Good evening. A donation of $1,047 has been offered to Nowlin Elementary School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for iPad Pro. A donation of $647.50 has been offered to Lindbergh Elementary School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for a camera. A donation of $623 has been offered to Lindbergh Elementary School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for LLI kits. A donation of $505 has been offered to Etzelford High School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for rolling whiteboards. A donation of $1,075 has been offered to Bryant Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for sound field. A donation of $1,360 has been offered to Etzelford High School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for BPA registration. A donation of $650 has been offered to Bryant Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for a drum set. A donation of $5,000 has been offered to Stout Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for Stout Theater Sound System. A donation of $500 has been offered to Eunice Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation for Robotics. A donation of $25,000 has been offered to all elementary schools by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for labs. A donation of $7,000 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for the auditorium sound system. A donation of 14 various Paramount weight machines has been offered to Fortson High School by Beaumont Wellness Center to be used in the weight room on a daily basis by physical education classes at Fortson High School. A donation of three various Paramount weight machines and three weight benches has been offered to Etzelford High School by Beaumont Wellness Center to be used in the weight room on a daily basis by physical education classes at Etzelford High School. A donation of 22 copies of the Saved Seed has been offered to each elementary media center by Teresa Bungie, who represents the Dearborn Garden Center, to be used in each elementary media center as a stepping stone to educate and inspire students to develop a lifelong love of planting and gardening. Thank you. Trustee Lane. Uh, that last one was a donation by the Dearborn Garden Club. I think Ms. Bungie was the person that wrote the letter. I, I was at their meeting today. So. Thank you. Nice job. Next item, please. Citizen participation. Citizens wishing to address the board on agenda and <clears throat> non-agenda items for action who are signed in by 7:10 p.m. by submitting a blue card to the secretary may speak at this time. The board may not be in position to respond to non-agenda items. Therefore, speakers should not anticipate an immediate response to their comments or questions. For the benefit of all concerned, do not mention the names of students or school district employees. Please keep your comments as brief as possible, and the board president reserves the right to limit times. I have a lot of blue cards tonight, so I'm going to start with the agenda items. We have Mr. Ali Hamoud. And Jaslyn Pina of Dearborn wants to speak to us about freshman separation slash, <coughs> slash school boundaries. May I request that people try to limit themselves to three minutes? Thank you. Okay, I just want to start off introducing myself. I'm Jaslyn Pina. I'm a senior at Fortson High. Hello, my name is Ali Hamoud. I'm also a senior at Fortson High School. So we are here to talk to you today about the division of the Freshman Academy. You know, it's kind of a topic that many have been talking about. But well, before we begin, uh, uh, I would like to have a moment of silence for the students at Stoneman uh, Douglas High School. Um, thank you. Um, one of the factors why our school runs so smoothly is because of participation in clubs. Um, for example, I am part, me and Jasmine are both part of Link Crew, and where we mentor uh, lower classmen um, to guide them throughout high school. Um, and with the boundary change, not with the boundary changes, with the adding the new um, ninth grade academy, like separating them from high school, will um, take away clubs like this. And um, one of the reasons why our school is so successful is because the freshmen participate in so many clubs. 
for example, Key Club has so many participants in it because mo many of the freshmen um, aspire to be, you know, give back to the community. So they join Key Club and all, all these different clubs. Um, Jaslyn and I had the opportunity to talk to teachers, counselors, and liais liaisons about the topic. Uh, majority of the um, teachers believed that this de decision was one to steer away from. Um, reason why they didn't like the decision was loss of a high school experience, transportation conflicts, and chance to look up to someone older. Uh, parental management and isolation from home building was also an issue. And we, you know, you guys, this was the first conversation we talked about, and we heard everything that you guys had to say. But there's just so many downsides that come from this, you know, parent management. My mom was a single parent. She had five kids, put us all through um, Fortson and, you know, Lori Middle School and elementary. Our school, our house was right there, right next to schools, so we could walk, and she could go to work with no worry because we had older siblings to come pick us up and walk us home. With the division, it'd kind of be hard to moving a bunch of freshmen, especially if they have older siblings in, you know, Fortson or um, younger siblings in Lori. It'd be kind of hard to manage all the time with, you know, three different kids in three different buildings. So kind of keeping the freshmen with their older sibling or just keeping the freshmen at one school in one place, not moving them anywhere would kind of be beneficial for everyone, especially for the parents who you guys said would take a lot of convincing to kind of get them on board with the new boundaries. But kind of getting them um, comfortable with it, yes, and understanding where they come from with their time because they have lives and they work as well. Um, the cost efficiency, yes, we don't have the exact numbers, but we know that buying a new building, renovating the whole building to kind of meet the standards of the state. Transportation, you'd have to add transportation to get kids to and from forts in for after school activities like sports, clubs. It'd just be too much of a hassle and you could just easily, you know, kind of divide the boundaries, make it a little bit more lenient and so that, um, sorry, so that like the buses could just go like a different route. So it wouldn't, we wouldn't be adding buses or we wouldn't you know, be adding so much money to our costs that that could be put to greater use. Um, so I mean, it's, it's as hard as you guys were talking about it. It's not a simple solution. It takes some time, definitely. But making it easier for Fortson to have less students, and especially with the programs that a lot of our you know, principals are trying to put into place to get more students out of the building, but to greater places, um, that kind of be like I definitely agree with what you guys are saying. Moving the forward with those programs, but moving the entire freshman academy to a different building, like it just doesn't make any sense. They'd lose a connection with their older peers. They'd lose, you know, their mentor. They'd lose someone to look up to. They'd lose the safety. They'd be and just isolated by themselves, and it it'd be scary because they won't. They won't grow or they won't develop. Staying a freshman, they're, they're, they're all immature. We all know this. You know, they're still young. With them being at Fortson or with any of our high schools, it kind of gives them the advantage to grow. For us to kind of step up and be like, hey, guys, this isn't right. This isn't cool. Like, you shouldn't be acting like this. You're maturing. You're in high school now. You know, they need that four-year experience with their older peers, and they kind of need... That they need that safety knowing that, hey, I have other, other people, and like with Link Crew, they have other people, and if you move them, the sophomores are just going to be the immature ones. There's going to be no change. It'd just be worse. <laughs> okay, I don't mean to be rude, but could you give me three, th three reasons why you don't want? Three reasons. Yeah. The parent management, cost efficiency, and just the mental change that it hap that it'd happened on uh, everyone. Okay. And, you know, counselors would be dealing with just freshmen. And freshmen, we all are hormonal at that moment. We're all kind of, well, yes, I mean, you know, it's true. And we're all kind of going through changes. We're, we're finding ourselves. We're finding who we are at freshman year. That is the one year that we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. And counselors, um, social workers, they just have so much on their case. So not that they don't already. But everyone at that age, by themselves, it would just be more difficult for right. everyone and everything. Can I thank you for your presentation? Yeah, and I thank and you we for can your move time. on. But yeah. thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Hormonal freshman. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, Next speak. Go ahead. Mr. Ernie Oz, Dearborn, <laughs> would like to speak to us regarding boundaries and school safety. Good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a resident of Dearborn, Michigan, and I've been involved in a variety of different uh, school matters in the past. And uh, while I haven't been around as much lately, I have, um, I was, I was deeply troubled, as I'm sure all of us were, with the shooting in Parkland, Florida. Um, I happened to be in Florida at the time. Mm. The, um, the upshot of that is that we have a new conversation starting up, as typically happens after these tragedies, and it tends to go with uh, the issues on one side of gun control and on mental health as, as the causation factor uh, on the other hand. And the sad thing about it is that uh, when people take one side or the other, they tend to uh, downplay the other, and it's both. It's both those issues, and it's other issues as well. As a school district, there's little that we can do other than advocate on issues of gun control. But there's a considerable amount that we can do with regard to the mental health of our students. And that's what I would like to address today on, on two different aspects. I understand that the district is close to determining at least a short-term uh, resolution or um, effort to uh, alleviate overcrowding in the high schools for right now and that uh, the matter will be revisited again um, in a couple of years. I would urge you to consider that adding buildings or adding to buildings to increase capacity just puts a larger population in buildings and shifting buildings or shifting populations, students, people, um, from building to building to accommodate numbers loses, in my opinion, the reality of what it does to these kids. I mean, these, these are our students, and for as much as you have a difficult situation from a financial standpoint and from a logistical standpoint, still in all, these are students, and they have as the young lady mentioned, a lot of issues going on at, at that particular time as adolescents. They have a lot of issues going on right then already. Taking kids from one side of town to the other side of town takes them out of their communities, takes them out of the friendships that they would have in their communities, puts them in a school on the other side of town where the school friends are friends that they don't be, that they're not able to have uh, much contact with because they go back to the other side of town. It makes life a little bit harder for them. And for that reason, I would urge that at such time as soon as possible, as the district will consider it, a fourth high school is the appropriate way to address the situation of overcrowding, particularly in light of the fact that for over 20 years we have had year to year an increase in student population in this district and there's nothing that indicates that it will change in the, in the coming years. The addition of additional uh, rooms to buildings is a short-term fix, it's a patch and it's not a solution that addresses I think the real needs of our students. Obviously there, there are any, any number of financial aspects to this, but I believe that properly educated in the realities of the situation, the community will back what is necessary to do the right thing for our kids and to put our students first. Thank you. I, I also wanted to um, mention student health and safety because that's the other issue. And I think that safety is, there, there is a mental health aspect to um, what we do in the schools as far as boundaries and schools and the size of schools. There is a mental health element to uh, what happens with our kids on a day-to-day -day basis. And when people examine the profiles of the people who commit these, these horrible crimes in Parkland, Florida and uh, places like Columbine and Sandy Hook and altogether too many others, two things come up. The 
bewilderment of some people that it happened there, that it would ever happen in their community. None of us wants it to happen here. The other thing is the profile of the people who commit these crimes is that they have problems. They, they do have, while they have access to weapons that they shouldn't, they have underlying problems with mental health. And in most cases in school shootings, they are either current or former students. There are things that I think that we can do, and very briefly, I will say that I would recommend that the district um, put forth an effort to create a library of short videos that could be put together by professionals from within our community who would volunteer their time. Our students could be the producers of these uh, videos. Make a library of these things, have them available on the website, and have them available by an app that students can download to their phones so that they have access privately to resources where they can uh, get assistance and direction for issues like depression, um, drugs, abuse, um, any type of, of subject, unwanted pregnancies, so that they have, <clears throat> they have resources in addition to what's available in the schools and at home. In addition, I think that the district needs to consider uh, increasing the number of counselors that we have available and school nurses, again, because we have for years um, had to get by with fewer than what we had at one time. Lastly, I would urge the school district to, and the Board of Education to change the start times for adolescents. Uh, there is a tidal wave of research that it consistently says that this not only, that later start times for adolescents would not only improve the academics of the students, but would improve their mental health, their physical health, their financial health. A RAND Corporation recently uh, did a study and they determined that if all the schools in the country switched to starting adolescents in schools, at 8.30 or later, it would save the United States economy $9.3 billion per year. It is money that is well spent, it is cost effective, and it has value, particularly for our kids. And again, it is, uh, there are position statements in the last few years by the American Medical As Association, the Association for uh, the, the Academy for uh, Pediatrics, the American Academy for Pediatrics, and the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has even said, all three of these in particular have said that school should start at 8.30 or later for adolescents. That means middle school and high school. We can do it if we determine that we, we, can, that we want to do it and that we should do it, and we should. So I would urge you to please take action on that. This matter has, has been before the board in the past. Um, it has been the subject of, of dozens of studies uh, for the past over 20 years. And I have, because I'm trying to keep my, my uh, presentation as short as possible, I have something in writing to supplement what I would say otherwise. And I would um, ask you to please review this and see that it is clearly in the best interest of our students to make this change. It will help them. It will deflect the possibility that we become, God forbid, one of these, one of these communities that has to worry about the aftermath of a tragedy. Thank Not you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Lane. Um, Thank you, Mr. Oz. I know the issue. He's been an advocate for ah. this issue for many, many years. Okay. But I would like to suggest to Dr. Maleko, it's normally in our board briefs every week that uh, you're looking for ideas for the show, What's Happening in Dearborn. Um, I think interviewing some of our school social workers and counselors on these topics is a great idea. Um, and they could give a lot of expertise. Dr. Bazzi Gates does a fabulous presentation. A lot of us have seen it several times, but on topic of warning signs, mental health, depression, um, other things. Mm -hmm. So we have this expertise. Sure. Our counselors could do it, our psychologists, but it, it's a good idea and we should be tapping our own expertise. So thank you. Thank you. Sure, I'll pass them on. 
Next. Also have Mr. Hilal Bazi of Dearborn would like to speak to us regarding boundary line changes and the walkout. Please consider limiting yourself to three minutes. Thank I you. Will. I, I don't will. mean to be mean, yeah, but okay. we'll be I'll here till two in the morning. Um, yes. So I'm going to quickly just discuss three things um, that I care about. I'm actually a senior at Fortson High School, so I'll be exiting the district after this year, but I do have relatives and family members that will be attending, uh, that are still attending the public schools. Um, so first thing I want to talk about is school safety. Um, obviously a tragic incident that happened in Florida, and I just want to emphasize that I really think that this, this district needs to be proactive when it comes to policy uh, that's coming from, uh, that's spewing actually from federal, um, you know, uh, bureaucratic agencies and government officials. I really think that um, officials in our federal government are spewing out horrendous, atrocious, and obnoxious policies that don't belong in our schools in regards to guns. Um, I appreciate Trustee Fetchlikoff uh, for you calling out uh, Betsy DeVos because she's an idiot. Um, she has no clue what she's doing. She ruined Michigan public schools mm -hmm. and her policies and the, the current federal administration's policies do not belong in Dearborn public schools. So please be proactive on calling out these policies in regards to guns because they do not belong in schools. Now on my second note, um, the next thing I want to talk about is boundary line changes. Um, so you know, obviously there's going to be a decision made today, and I just want to emphasize that these decisions are going to have a huge toll on students. And I really want to emphasize the fact of commu community when making these decisions. Um, in Forts, and we rally behind each other in things that we do at our school and all the events that we have, whether it's fundraising or community events, because we all live around the school. We all, you know, we all have that bond. And I really think, you know, the hindrance in that community aspect with these boundary line changes is a huge mistake and I please try to take that in consideration when you guys are making your changes. Also I attend the Dearborn uh, Center for Math Science and Technology DCMST and if you guys are going to be expanding programs like the Michael Berry Center or any other programs like this please make sure you do it right. I attended DCMST with the first year where they tried to double its class size and it was the most horrendous decision that they ever made and they were pressured by administrators in the district and it did not turn out well. The retention rates of our students in that class was lower than any other year and it was not good. So if you are going to expand these programs, you have to do it right and you have to make sure that you guys uh, supply these programs with the money and the things that they need in order to succeed. And on my third and last note, just quickly was on the thing, but graduation rates, you know, I'm very proud of how far this district has come, especially with graduation rates. But I really do think that we have to make sure that our students are not only graduating with a diploma, but a vision toward the future and, you know, an uh, idea of what they want to do for a career. And I applaud Ms. Al-Qadri and the work that she's been doing at Fortson because that's, uh, you know, one of her top goals at Fortson to ensure that students are leaving not just with a diploma, but, you know, a, vi a vision forward and making sure that they know what they're going to do in the future. And that's very important because this district is failing students once they, once they graduate. Students are having trouble finding jobs. We're not emphasizing on things like vocational and trade. And these are the types of things that we have to bring back into our school district. Thank you guys so much. Please take all this into consideration. Thank you. Next person. Next speaker. Zainab Al Hashimi of Dearborn would like to speak to us regarding boundary line. Follow up that one, Zainab. <laughs> So hi, my name is Anabel Hashmi. I am a sophomore at Fortson High School, and I'd like to address the boundary line issue. I know the matter is a highly contended one, so I'll keep it short and sweet. You've been to our schools, you've heard our students speak, you've heard the concerns of our parents. So when you vote, I ask that you leave behind your bureaucratic red tape, leave behind your politics, your sectional division. You, your vote is your constituents vote. Your vote is the vote of every taxpayer in this room who put you in office. It's the vote of every student over here that went around, knocked doors for you, phone baked for you, worked the polls for you. Your vote is our vote. And I urge you to act accordingly and vote for proposal two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mead, moving forward, these are non-agenda items. Non-agenda items yes, next. Sir. So we have Ms. Reem Abuzaid of Dearborn wants to speak to us regarding Fortson High School e-board student government. <coughs> um, hello, school board, superintendent, and community. 
Uh, my name is Rima Bazid, president of Fortson High School's eboard uh, student government. And I just wanted to talk about today um, student government and how uh, it's been going on throughout the this year with um, our board. And um, we also, I also wanted to touch base on how our teachers are so supportive and helpful throughout our guidance and our voice, finding our voice throughout our high school years. Um, since eighth grade, teachers were pushing me to my limit as a student fresh from overseas. And um, going into ninth grade and my high school career, I mean, I can name a bunch of teachers who I can think of right now on the top of my head who helped me find my uh, voice and shape my career as a high school student and as a, a senior who's graduating. Um, I just wanted to say that thank you to all the teachers who are listening to this right now and all the teachers that are here dedicating their time um, and just helping students outside of school like during the football games when teachers come to support the football players um, my coach mr murray everyone just in general and um we also i also wanted to talk about pride week we're doing up um this week of on in fortson it's called pride week where we uh bring in respected figures we bring in um and we empower students we uh we're cleaning up the school inside and out and we're just trying to help uh get students to support and spirit that is needed in our school. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. What happened to my secretary? Uh, <laughs> all right. Our next speaker is going to be Miss Angela Altamonte. I hope I said that right. And she'll be speaking to us about what's happening at Fortson High School with staff. Hello. Um, good evening. Um, I just wanted to um, come. I'm so nervous. Um, I just honestly wanted bite. to talk about um, just not just Fortson, but um, I'm the student government executive board, and I'm I'm a part of the youth commission as well. Um, so I've attended a number of events, and I just want to say between administration staff at our building, they really come out and support. Um, we did the first year in 13 years. We did a parade. At Fortson High School, it's something that um, when I got into student government, I tried to implement. Last year, we had about seven clubs that came out and participated. This year, we had a number of feeder schools, which are about 13 or 15 different clubs. And these are teachers that take their time out to make floats. And so we moved from student council usually doing floats to everyone. And we had principals and teachers and a number of other people that came to our event and walked in our um, parade. And it was an awesome event to um, bring in the forts in as well as just staff members that come out and support basketball games our staff charity basketball games this friday all the proceeds will go to zaman and we do a number of these things where staff members <coughs> spend time outside of their um to-do list so to speak and be able to support in a different way to show not only examples in the classroom but outside of the classroom what leadership looks like and for me being a part of dearborn public schools as a student those are the moments that I remembered the most is my teachers at Dearborn High who spent the time outside of the classroom with me. And actually, um, I used her as an example to be the executive board that I am today. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Ms. Lisa Kenyon. Uh, wants to speak to us regarding the drama at Fortson. Kenyon. I think I butchered your last name. Hi, would you like to tell us your name? Lisa Kenny Annan. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I teach French at Fortson in Film Studies, and I just wanted to update people. Um, Fortson used to have a pretty vibrant theater program quite a while ago, and it um, dissipated for different reasons over the years. But um, a few years ago, students asked me to revive it, and as a club, we have gone from um, something pretty non-existent, and again, it's all after school, Students being involved, um, administrative support, and um, teachers like myself in particular directing and giving our time. And um, we have just recently put on a production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream, which um, got a really decent audience. So we were all pretty <laughs> excited about that. And so um, just wanted to let you know that the beautiful facility that we have at Fortson is being utilized um, in one of the original intentions for it, which is to produce theater there. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank nice you. job. <laughs> Oh, bless you. Just a reminder, uh, 
When you're speaking, please don't mention names of district employees or personnel. Uh, next, uh, next speaker is Mr. David Tran of Dearborn Heights would like to speak to us regarding schools and teachers. Hi everyone, just a quick notice. If you guys happen to know me or my mom, please don't tell her she's here. She thinks I'm studying in the library right now, but I'm actually here, so <laughs> <laughs> just letting you know. Um, I'm just here for my reason, um, just to advocate for the teachers, just reminding everyone how grateful I am for them. So just a little speech I wrote up after like an hour ago, so bear with me, okay? <laughs> the meaning of pride, tradition, and legacy never seemed to interest me when I was a freshman. I never knew what community service or the idea of leadership was, but that was four years ago. Now, the whole idea of student leadership has achieved a new level in our generation. As I am a senior at Fordson High School, and I'm quite proud to be a tractor, I learned a lot from my organizations, from working hands-on and planning events with student government, to attending school and city events, being inspired to do more for our community. Tonight, I'm gonna tell you about two of my beloved organizations that created me into the student leader I am today. Key Club is an internationally known organization led by yours truly, high school students. They work alongside Kiwanis, an adult group of leaders who serve to create an impact in the world with kids. This was the beginning of my journey. There was also the, the place where I met one of my most impactful teachers, which I will not name. She pushed me out of my comfort <laughs> zone, and unfortunately, it was pretty awkward as a freshman. Um, but granted, it never hurts anyone to be put in a kind of moment that will exchange for you a bigger impact. Progressing through four years, I became a state secretary for the Michigan District of Key Club, which is a prestigious position, second command. We do service events, work with other high schools, Embrace that Key Club does not make keys, but opens doors for 300,000 Key Clubbers around the world. Secondly, the one organization that recently just finished its premier project, Dearborn's Got Talent, has touched my heart in any way possible. The City of Dearborn Youth Affairs Commission is a group of high schoolers that I'll never forget. But on top of them is a certain group of adults that have pushed tirelessly for hard effort and passion from within each of us. A teacher from Fortson High School, Dearborn High School, Henry Ford Academy, and Etzel Ford High School work along city advisors from the city of Dearborn in creating a successful pact of young adults in creating what we call the Young Voices of Dearborn. Whether it was discussing about major emphasis topics to handling our biggest events, the adults seek to amaze me every time because without their guidance, all this stress and dysfunction would have never been relieved. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of stress for a 70-year-old like me. We've always taken our teachers for granted. We never stop to think about all the hard work they put for us kids. Yes, we are still kids. Because as kids, we still have a lot to learn. The role of a teacher isn't simply just teaching a subject. No, it's a lot more than that. It's being a guide to one's path, showing them the way. It's being there after hours, working with that one student that wants to know more. It's being there and putting the effort as a parent, sibling, cousin, or friend in order to help these kids move forward. I honestly don't know where I would be without these unlimited support and love from these teachers. Because in the teacher's eyes, students come first. Thank you. <laughs> David, I must stand recognize you with your tuxedo. Great job the other night for you. You and your team did an awesome job at uh, Dearborn's Got Talent. Our next speaker is Mr. Alabes Farhad from Dearborn. Would like to speak to us regarding school teachers. Just a moment, if you will, so I can take off my gloves. Just a moment, I popped. Okay. So, yeah, my name is Alabas Farhat. Some of you may remember me uh, from the last few times I've spoke, but I can assure you we're on much better, you know, much better ground. A subject I think we can all agree on is that the hard work and the dedication the teachers, not just in this room, but the ones that are not here, put in time, day in and day out. Attending Forts in High School, I think, is the prime example. Uh, if we look at AP Calc, AP Chem, we have some of the highest passing rates, not just in the state, but nationally. But it's not just about those test rates, it's about the unsung heroes. We have teachers that put in hours, staying in till six, till five, just giving extra attention to the students when they need it. And to those teachers, I applaud you, right? It is them who puts in that extra time and give attention to subjects otherwise not in the curriculum. For example, recently the Arab Student Union, a club at Fortson, had the privilege of putting on a poetry slam were over 30 students from across the district, Edsel, Dearborn High, uh, Fortson, and the middle schools as well, and some elementary schools, in fact, were able to participate and express their ideas in a creative form, creative art, if you will. And through this platform, through the guidance of teachers taking time out of their day, 
we had, I believe, five judges or four judges that were teachers who came there out of their way to judge and help give constructive criticism to these young people. And to them, I applaud you. Because if it wasn't for them giving that time, there wouldn't be no outlet for these students otherwise. You know, we heard Betsy DeVos's name mentioned earlier and that abysmal 60 minutes interview she had. And I couldn't help but think one line resonated with me. When they asked her, have you visited the schools that need more, more attention? She's like, no, I've not intentionally done that. And yet when early they were, we were presenting on why graduation rates are so high, one of the prime reasons was when students are off track, we give them that attention. And I think that's definitely a page she can take out of our notebook. And I think that goes to the hard work of the teachers in this room as well as to the administrators. And to you guys, I applaud you for all the hard work. As a senior, going through these four years at Fortson, I could not think of a better way to send off. Hopefully, I'm not here to talk about my opinion on the proposals, but hopefully I have faith that the right decision will be made today. And I have faith that regardless of the decision, the teachers in this room will not give up on the students. And that with the tools given, they will succeed. These students will go on and do great things. Thank you. I kind of feel bad now, remind them not to mention district's names. I, I thought I couldn't, I wasn't sure which direction it was going, negative <laughs> or positive, but thank you, students. Uh, next speakers are Kathy Loss and Bruce Leapy, representing the GSRP staff. They want to speak to us regarding the positive impact of GSRP felt throughout the district. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. So we just kind of wanted to take a few moments to talk to all of you about some of the positive work that the GSRP staff is doing throughout the district in the city of Dearborn. We kind of are a collaborative team. This just represents a fraction of the 29 of us throughout 10 or 11 buildings, depending if you put Salinas together or separately. And lost my train of thought. But how, we, how we're going forward to keep putting students first and grabbing those first ones even before they get to us at the preschool level. Um, so some of the stuff that we do just as uh, GSRP, which is the pre-kindergarten, um, the students have to be eligible to go into kindergarten the following year. Um, some of the things that we do is we do home visits twice a year. We go into every single one of those houses twice a year, see the family, see the kids at their own, um, at, at, at their, their comfort level, at their house. Um, we do monthly parent meetings um, to talk about different things to help educate the parents, to give them a good basis for educating their students for the future. Um, we do daily communication with all of our parents because they come and pick up their kids, so we talk to them on a regular basis. Um, we have a collaboration with the kindergartens and the young fives teachers, so we have that collaboration, which is a, new, a unique thing that we get to, to do. Um, we have the pre-KK committee where we, we collaborate on the curriculum going forward. And then we have the Parent University, and Kathy will talk about that specifically. So for Parent University, this is our second year up and running now. We started it off last year. And we are focusing on serving families in the district who have children anywhere from six months up through four years of age. Sometimes we get a little bit older ones in there as well. We currently have those university sessions for parents at six different buildings throughout the district at Cotter, at Salina Elementary, at Henry Ford, at Whitmore Bowles, at River Oaks, and at McCullough Eunice. And kind of all together in that, we have 25 GSRP staff members who come together in some form of way, whether it be on the Parent University Committee, designing the lessons, reaching out into the district to other people, such as the LAHC, the Covenant House, um, Dearborn Police, Dearborn Firefighters, our school resource officers help me grow to do the ages and stages questionnaires with our families to make sure that their children are right on track for where they need to be when they do enter the public school system. We take time to educate them on topics with their young children going as far as science to math to language and literacy to fine motor, gross motor, dental, um, nutrition, what did I miss? Social emotional. Thank you, social and emotional development as well as music and movement and speech and language, and we collaborate with others throughout the district who I won't name at this time, but our tech coaches, speech language pathologists, um, social, social, oh my gosh, social workers, um, occupational therapists, and special ed resource teachers. Um, and we've also been going into the local mosques to enlist their help and trying to recruit to families as well to help build up for the upcoming school years as doing more parent university for our district. Awesome. So, I think that's it. Wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
next speaker, Mrs. Amanda Wolski, would like to speak to us regarding how outstanding Maple School is. Um, thank you. I just wanted to spend a couple minutes and we, or three minutes, um, and we have a few other people who wanted to share a few things. I, you got it'll the be, message. Yeah, yeah it'll yeah, be quick. Yeah. Um, thank you. So we do a lot of great things at Maples outside of the regular school day. Um, a couple of us um, coach girls running club. So we have fourth and fifth grade girls that we spend a few days a month after school working with them. Um, we, t we have 50 girls that come to girls running club in fourth and fifth grade. We work with them on a healthy active lifestyle. Um, we take them to the girls mar or to the running fit Martian marathon in April. Um, we've the Maple School has been taking them for about eight years now and that's on a Saturday and um, not all the girls come to school with proper running shoes um, so I keep a basket of running shoes in my classroom so girls know they can come to me and get you know shoes for gym class or for um, running club if they need so I always take donations for shoes from people who have smaller feet than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it okay if somebody else? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I um, work with the students at Maples as a music teacher and do before and after school events. And I am really lucky because I have a wonderful group of students and we work on the Maples drumming program and we have a chorus and we have a recorder ensemble and our group is growing. We probably have over 100 students who come in the mornings, <coughs> Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And so they're working so hard and we, we love to go out in the community and show off what Dearborn Schools children are doing. And the beautiful thing is we're an outreach place in our group because we, we work with, um, we work with nonprofits to help um, support them, like the, um, like the, Re the Relay for Life and also we perform at the Festival of Trees to support Children's Hospital. It's really important for the students to know that they're giving back and they're helping and they take great pride in that. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ronald Kadrin. I'll be speaking about the um, family fun night that we do at uh, literacy night that we do at Maples Elementary School. Um, family nights are a great way to create a sense of uh, community. They help parents get connected to the school and show kids that school can be fun where parents, teachers, and children can have fun together. Um, end of March, every year, hundreds of families come to celebrate March is reading month and reading at Maples Elementary School. All the teachers run literacy stations such as bingo, book walk, storytelling, etc. This year, the building is dedicated this day for um, the theme jungle. The end results of our literacy night is always awareness of literacy, issues and education for parents on how to better prepare their children. Please join us on the 26th of March to show your support and to keep Maples a great school to be in. Thank you. Hi, I'm the Young Five teacher at Maples and when I heard that we're opening up a Young Five, I quickly jumped to it and was like, I want to teach Young Five. <laughs> I immediately thought about all the questions and concerns our parents and students would have about this new program, like why Young Five, and uh, will my kid be behind, and what is Young Five? I wanted the school here to start with relief for my parents and a strong start for my students. During the summer, I called every parent and scheduled an appointment for a home visit. They were shocked, but eager to ask many questions. During each visit, I assessed each student and answered all my parents' questions and concerns. I was able to start the first day of class knowing all my students their social needs and academic needs. My students had less anxiety and were eager to start their learning journey, thus giving us an amazing start of the school year. I will continue to do this every school year because it was an amazing result. We have, we have had successful achievement. This, that strong connection between home and school was made from day one and making this year one of the best teaching experiences I had. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Dr. Mead, the next three speakers asked to come up together. Okay. We have Ms. Julie Sorazio, 
would like to speak us regarding teacher love. We have Fatum Rajan, but like, uh, sounds like read us a teacher poem. And Mrs. Patricia Maksud, what do teachers do? Are these all teachers? Yes, we are. Oh. Just like everybody that's Aren't been you coming the, out. Aren't you getting the theme? I, 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 I'm finally catching on. I was going to say. <laughs> but I'm very impressed with is all of you. This what the district is about, teaching? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> all right. And we like energizer, energizer batteries. We're still going. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Mine's dying. 14 hours, 15 hours. <laughs> Okay. Um, good evening, President Lane, uh, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Dr. Maleko, ladies and gentlemen. On November 13 of this year, my colleagues and I were honored to be invited here and recognized for receiving the National, National Blue Ribbon Award. And that night, I shared with you that one of the main ingredients to our successful secret sauce that led to the title of Blue Ribbon School were mainly our dedicated, compassionate, and highly effective teachers. It is those teachers who go above and beyond their duties to put students first. It's those teachers who use their expertise and knowledge gained from years and years of instructing, training, enlightening, and guiding to pave the way for our students so they can become successful and accomplished human beings. Sorry, my mouth is dry now. <laughs> However, as you all know, raising a successful future generation is a huge responsibility. As teachers, we have been entrusted with these souls who step into our classrooms from all walks of life, filled with anticipation and impatient eagerness, ready to explore, question, and dare to dream the impossible dream. And as dedicated professionals who have the utmost reverence for this profession, know that as soon as those kids walk through our doors, there is no turning back. As educators, we have been exclusively designated and selected to shape our future generations because teaching is not a job or just a career, but a privilege. You are probably wondering, what do I mean by above and beyond? Well, the above and beyond activities you do not observe during your walkthroughs or SIP visits are what I'm referring to. And I'm going to take you backstage on a little tour and heels are not allowed. <laughs> um, it would be like investing times volunteering before and after school to tutor kids who have no help at home and are at risk of failing. Allowing students who don't own Chromebooks to come early and stay after school if they need to complete an assignment or a project. Every day I'm at school between 7.30 and 7.45 to make sure that I'm set and ready to start teaching as soon as the kids walk in. For example, I check my emails, make copies, prepare science experiments, and celebrate with hot chocolate, bagels, and donuts, yes, sugar, with students who achieved high scores on their class dojo charts. And this is like an app, I don't know if you're familiar with, but I share it with the parents, and it's connected to their phones and computers. It keeps track of their behavior, assignments, anything. Throughout the day, my role is not limited to instructional teaching. Many times I have stepped into the role of a nurse, a social worker, a dentist, a doctor, a parent, a friend, and so on. Um, which, of course, must be integrated into my daily schedule, regardless of it being part of my planned schedule or not. But I am dealing with little human beings, not letters and numbers. So medical emergencies can't wait. Nosebleeds can't wait. Vomiting, asthma attacks, seizures, testing and administering shots to diabetic kids, etc., can't wait. However, the real challenge is when emergencies arise and you are alone on the second floor. Beside the medical issues in my classroom, I have many kids who are at risk due to either language barriers, difficulty processing information, emotionally impaired, and so on. To meet the various needs of these students while keeping my head above water and with minimal support, sometimes leaving me with wishing for a magic wand. Um, and uh, most of the time, my preps are not used for planning, but I also meet, I try to meet with parents. And when they don't come for meeting, um, I end up spending most of the time after school, so which I don't make it home till six. Um, I'm also the piggy bank, where children begin when parents can't afford to pay for field trips, birthday cakes, or for a mother or father's day gift from our school PTA shop. I'm also the snack pantry, for those who never come with healthy snacks, if at all not to mention digging into my own wallet for necessary school supplies. 
Um, I'm also a counselor who provides children with a shoulder to cry on. One of my students walked into my classroom one day feeling sad and tearful. I remember it was a Monday after Mother's Day, and we spent the whole week on writing and decorating Mother's Day cards. So I took her aside to talk, only to find out that when she walked into her mother's room on Sunday morning to hand her the card, she was told that her mother had passed away during the night. However, what made matters worse is that little girl who was dying inside was not allowed to mention or talk about her mother. At home, that truly really broke my heart. The next day, I brought her a diary with a key to help her write her feelings down and only to share with me if she chose. We sometimes forget that our classrooms are the only safe haven for many kids. The list goes on and on. I'm positive that none of these, of these above and beyond activities were on your checklist when you did your walkthrough. And for those reasons and more, that is why teaching is not only a lifetime career, but a privilege. And your tour is done. You could put your heels back on. <laughs> My theme is teacher love, as we have heard this evening. My name is Julie Serrazio. I'm the instructional coach at Becker. I was inspired by teacher love, so I decided to write a little poem. So here we go. When I was little, I had two dreams, a teacher or a nun, is what I had seen. But my mom helped set me straight for the dream that would come true. She said, being a teacher is in the cards for you. So in 1993, the dream came alive, because that's when my teaching career started to thrive. I got all my Sharpies and paper mates galore, but soon I would find out that teaching is so, so much more. It's meeting with parents before the day starts a feel, a, and feeling a love for kids that is deep in your heart. It's collaborating with colleagues after hours and then they text you at home to do lesson plans. Or how about the Knights of Book Bingo or Talent Show or Chess? Of course the teachers are there. Would you expect anything less? It's Band-Aids for Kids and a Hug When They're Blue and a fist bump to celebrate a student who masters multiplication by two. The sleepless nights when a student is on your mind or wondering how to help the student who is falling behind. Or how about attending meetings and professional, professional development too or studying data to see how much a student grew. We love what we do from 8.30 till 4, but remember our day doesn't stop when we leave the school door. It's planning, teaching, caring, and paperwork galore but the heart of all we do has the best interest of the students in store. For 25 years I have been teaching. My mother was right. Teaching fills your heart and makes, make, teaching fills your soul and makes your heart bright. So the choice to be the teacher is one of dedication, passion, and dreams to pursue. But remember, we are here for the students and all, oh yes, all that we do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Fafner Reslin, and I'm a teacher at Becker. So I teach kindergarten, so um, it was only appropriate that I created a poem as well. It's our theme, sorry, <laughs> Becker theme. Teaching is the game. Of course I did it for the fame. I could not wait to get into that school to impress everyone or look like a fool. From pens to pencils, charts, and graphs, soon I was making all my students laugh. I go above and beyond every single day, and I do it for no extra pay. I spend hours and minutes planning and so much more so that I can see all of my students soar. Because the truth is, teachers just want the best. These kids are more than just a test. I soon realized that teaching was tough. However, quite frankly, I will never get enough. My family continued to tell me, I believe in you and all the great things that you do. They told me to keep up the fight because they see me toiling day and night. After all is said and done, Becker and Dearborn are second to none. Thank you.